I'm Susan Euler. This program is about the Renaissance. The Renaissance produced some of the most beautiful art the Western world has ever seen. However, it was also a time of great chaos, religious persecutions, terrible punishments, and sanitary conditions that I think modern people would find very unacceptable. The period we call the Renaissance, or the Renaissance if you prefer, began in Italy in the year 1400. Just like today, people living in 1400 saw the beginning of a new century as a turning point, marking a change from what had gone before. In fact, that's what the word Renaissance means, rebirth, Renaissance. In order for there to be a rebirth, there first has to have been a death. In the case of the Renaissance of 1400, the death was the collapse of classical civilization following the fall of Rome in the late 5th century. Although Europeans still lived among the ruins of Roman civilization, much had been lost or forgotten during the thousand years that separated the 5th from the 15th century. Europeans, Italians especially, began referring to those thousand years as the medieval or middle period, the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages, they believed, were dark, unenlightened times, existing between the glories of the ancient world and the glories they predicted for the modern era, the 15th century. The rebirth, therefore, was to be a rebirth of classical Greek and Roman learning, which had been allowed to go dormant during the previous centuries. The spirit of the Renaissance had actually begun over a hundred years earlier in the late Gothic period. As early as 1260, Artists such as Niccolo and Giovanni Pisano in Italy, and the unknown artist who created the tympanum, Death of the Virgin, for the Strasbourg Cathedral in France, were bringing back the realistic sculptural style of ancient Rome. Commerce was flourishing, and with it the emergence of a prosperous middle class. The Italian city-states of Siena and Florence even established democratic governments, something which had not been seen since ancient times. But all this prosperity and political enlightenment was brought to a sudden halt in 1347 when a new unknown disease began to spread throughout Europe. Known only as the Great Pestilence, by the time it had run its course six years later, an estimated 75 to 200 million people had died of it, between 30 and 60 percent of Europe's population. Today, we call that terrible disease the Black Death. The Black Death created social and political chaos, as well as immense personal tragedy. Kings and queens died, members of the nobility and high-ranking clergy died, peasants died, middle-class people died. In fact, the disease was so rampant in some areas that nearly everyone died, rich and poor, causing towns to be abandoned and shops and fields to be left unattended. After the worst of the pestilence abated, people were left to wonder who will be king, who will harvest our crops? Who can we get to make the things we all need in order to live? And with so many skilled men and women dead of plague, a political, social, and religious vacuum was created. Prices soared, jobs went unfilled, and wages skyrocketed. The course of history was changed. There's an old saying that it's an ill wind that blows no man good. And so it was with the Black Death. Those who survived found themselves in an excellent position to change the course of their lives for the better. Younger sons, who previously had no chance of inheriting their father's estate, now became rich beyond their wildest dreams. Many working class men and women, whose goods and services were in high demand, also became fabulously wealthy. Therefore, in the 50 years between the end of the plague and the beginning of the Renaissance, a new group of people came to power people who were not necessarily members of the old aristocracy. We would call them the nouveau riche. In England, they were referred to as new men. The Medici family of Florence, Italy, fit the definition of new men. They came from the working class and rose to become one of the most powerful families in Europe in only a few generations. Before the Black Death, the Medici had been low-level wool merchants and farmers, not rich, not important. 
However, they had the foresight, some would say the luck, to have safeguarded their warehouses during the plague years. When the plague abated in 1353, unlike many other warehouses that had been allowed to grow damp and moldy through neglect, the Medici warehouses were still fully stocked with dry, very saleable cloth. The scarcity of processed wool made it possible for them to sell their cloth at inflated prices. By 1400, the Medici had amassed a fortune and were just beginning to diversify by opening a small bank in the heart of Florence, where they offered loans at a high rate of interest, naturally. The Medici had a distant cousin who was already in the banking business, although he was not particularly successful. Nonetheless, it meant they had important contacts, and contacts meant everything. By the time Cosimo de' Medici became head of the family in 1429, their fortune from banking and the wool trade was given at 180,000 gold florins, which is a great deal of money when you consider that the average worker was earning less than 100 florins a year. So now we come to the real Renaissance. The Medici were just one of many middle-class and working-class families to rise to positions of great power and wealth during the political and social unrest of the 15th and 16th centuries. Naturally, they were resented, especially by the old aristocracy, who viewed them as ill-bred upstarts. But with so much money, how could you effectively keep new men such as the Medici in their place? Well, the old ruling class had a solution, sumptuary laws which made it illegal for people who were not titled nobility to wear certain kinds of clothes. This sounds ridiculous today, but during the Renaissance, it made a certain kind of sense. In many ways, Europe was still a feudal society, divided along definite class lines which were very difficult to cross. We all know the old fairy tales about a poor girl who grows up to marry a prince and live happily ever after. Well, that rarely, if ever, happened. And one way to make sure that it didn't happen was to enact laws that made it illegal to dress above your station. This concept can be clearly seen in portraits from the time. When we think of Renaissance art, we usually think of the big three, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael. However, there were many other artists working at the same time period. We're going to now look at the work of Hans Holbein, who was the court painter to the Tudor monarch, Henry VIII. Hans Holbein painted the definitive portrait of Henry VIII. It depicts the king when he was in his 40s, during the Anne Boleyn years. Although very overweight, Henry reveled in his large stature and dressed extremely lavishly in costly brocades, velvets, and furs, set off by precious stones and pearls. He never let anyone forget that he was the king. Henry VIII's father, Henry VII, or Henry Tudor, had only a tenuous claim to the throne of England from his mother's side, and it was from an illegitimate line. This is all War of the Roses politics that we won't go into here. Nevertheless, the fact that the Tudors were not descended from high-ranking nobility proved a huge embarrassment to them, and they constantly sought out ways to prove themselves as worthy of their position. The Tudors loved to pass sumptuary laws because it allowed them to lord their wealth and power over others. While in other countries such as Italy, sumptuary laws regulated low-cut necklines and high heels, in Tudor England, these laws were all about defining social class. If you look at other portraits painted by Hans Holbein depicting high-ranking officials of Henry's court and other non-royal people, you will see that they are not dressed in silks, brocades, and jewels. This is not because they couldn't afford it. They certainly could. No, the reason for the difference in clothing styles is because it was against the law for ordinary people in Renaissance England to wear luxurious fabrics such as velvets and brocades and therefore appear as gentlemen. Tudor terminology, not mine. It's crazy, and such laws were impossible to enforce, but they did give the monarch a legal way to keep people in their place and even lock them up if they became too defiant. Just another fact of life for those living in the real Renaissance. For the 
10 Minute Professor. This is Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for tuning in and make sure you watch our next program.